This episode of Case Acquaint contains subject matter which may not be appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi everybody, welcome back to Case Acquaint. We're getting ready to celebrate Valentine's Day. So I would like to wish all of you out there, wherever you are, a very happy Valentine's Day. We have an exceptional story for you today about a cold murder case, and hopefully you can help. But first, I need to give you some updates and let you know what we have coming up for you over the next several episodes. Right now, we're pretty much on all major platforms, including iTunes, Stitcher, Radio Public, Google Play, YouTube, and more. If you are using a platform that does not have our show in your catalog, let us know. Also, intermittently throughout the next several episodes, we're going to be talking with some of the representatives of organizations which have made it their mission to help solve cold cases of both missing persons and murder victims. Our expectation is that these conversations will help increase awareness of these types of services that may be available when a family has to quickly learn how to navigate themselves through the rough terrain of a case such as the one we'll be talking about today. And that particular type of experience is in part why we chose this case. Both the police department and the family of the victim have made unique efforts in support of resolution. Also, as you know, we've been following the Atlanta disappearance of Natalie White, who has now been missing for over a month. A GoFundMe page is still live because advocates are looking for answers, and frankly, the idea is to be able to pay for useful information. Whatever they raise needs to be enough to encourage someone to step forward or even for a quality private investigator to offer their services. So we continue keeping Natalie and her family in our thoughts and we'll keep you, our listeners, updated on her case. Please share Natalie's picture on all of your social media. Nobody's going to know about Natalie unless people take 10 seconds to let their friends and family know about her disappearance. Got an update for you on the Randy Leach case. Kansas State Representative John Alcala, a Democrat from Topeka, introduced House Bill 2571. This would be an amendment to the CORA, which means Kansas Open Records Act, and it would force release of information to which some agencies and members of the judiciary are blocking public access. It's an interesting bill. We would encourage you to check it out for many of its characteristics, but it also relates to the Randy Leach case in that it would require the release of their records from Randy's case so the public can inspect them, which is our right under the Freedom of Information Act. Randy's parents have been fighting for 20 years to get some of these records released, even though nobody is investigating Randy's case. Recently, their lawsuit to compel release was rejected by Leavenworth County District Judge David King. Obviously, we here at Case Acquaint would never support the release of records if doing so would compromise an investigation. But when there's no investigating that's been done for years, that is when it becomes a violation of public trust, casting suspicion on the agency, and injuring the parties interested in getting closure on the case, such as Randy's parents, for example. So thank you, Representative Alcala. Finally, one last thing. A big shout out to our awesome listeners who've been sharing the Chase Lackey episode. As a reminder, none of the law enforcement agencies are investigating this case. That's going to be up to people like you and me who care about what happened to Chase and his little dog champ. The podcast episode has now been posted on YouTube. So if you want to share something, that might be the easiest way to do it. For a link, visit our website, caseacquaint.com. Remember, the local media has never covered Chase's disappearance. We need to get some type of word out about Chase because we can't let him be forgotten. On with today's show. We're going to bring you the story of a cold case out of Palo Alto, California, a young woman minding her own business whose death is as puzzling as it is tragic. The police and the family are out of leads, but what they do have is hope. 
Can you help them solve this case? This is the story of Maria Ann Shao. In July of 2004, the owner of a building on Alma Street in Palo Alto, California, announced that the lease of the nightclub called the Q Cafe would be ending, and the 6,000-square-foot space would again be available to rent. The bottom of that article referenced what at the time was a three-year-old homicide case that was still casting a shadow over the property. That was when 21-year-old Maria Shao was shot and killed as she was leaving the Q Cafe, and unfortunately, and unfortunately, the case was still open and being actively investigated. Quoted the building's owner, We're getting all kinds of calls. Lots of people knew about the Q Cafe. After all, Palo Alto doesn't have many unsolved homicides. Back then, it was home to around 60,000 people. It was and is still known for its high quality of life and high cost of living due to its economic and geographic positioning. The subject of our story today, Maria, had just turned 21, and she was a student at the Academy of Art at University in San Francisco, studying digital special effects. Maria was well-liked, and the police later said they couldn't find anyone who would be considered any kind of an enemy of Maria. One thing they came to believe is that nobody had it in for her. So on the night in question, June 10, 2001, Maria was out on the town. She, her sister, and some friends were celebrating her 21st birthday, and they'd enjoyed a fun evening together. They'd gone out to dinner and afterwards stopped in at the Q Cafe, where many other young people were also going. As they were walking out the door and saying goodbye to each other, the street was full of people, some waiting to get into the club, others walking by, still others driving around in their cars. It was said that at that moment there had to be at least 200 people in the immediate vicinity of the crime. Suddenly a single shot rang out and Maria fell. According to reports, people ran in all directions when they heard the shot. Where did it come from? When police and emergency medical services arrived, they immediately took measures attempting to preserve Maria's young life. She was transported to the hospital and rushed into surgery. But Maria Shao died that night from a gunshot wound to her head. Can you imagine what her parents must have gone through? They were probably sitting at home not worrying one bit about their daughters because they were together until they received that phone call that families of violent crime victims know all too well. What about Maria's sister? In shock from the violence of the shooting, but powerless to redirect the path on which her little sister's life had been thrown, even though Maria's sister was a nurse. I guess sometimes when I research these cases, I say to myself, if only this person hadn't gotten involved with this other person or with this drug, or if only they hadn't gotten into that car, or if only he would have walked away from this situation. We've talked about this before on the podcast, just because someone may have engaged in risky behavior or made, in hindsight, what might not have been the most responsible decision, thus increasing their risk. It doesn't mean their killer should go free, because we've all engaged in risky behavior at one point or another. And what I'm saying about this case is that this person wasn't engaging in any risky behavior. She wasn't drinking. She wasn't in the position to lie to her family about an abusive partner, say. None of that. She didn't do anything but walk through the door of a business onto a public street. And if Maria hadn't been standing there innocently going about her personal and lawful business, that bullet probably would have hit someone else. I say to myself, maybe it would have hit one of my friends or one of my family members or me. The family has been proactive not only about keeping engaged with the investigation, which of course is necessary, but they've also done some other things. First, they got busy raising money for a reward. Between businesses and supporters, they've raised $100,000. So, there is an anonymous tip line, but if you know who did this, go get your $100,000. The other thing they've done is they've preserved Maria's legacy in a positive way, 
which enables them to contribute to the community in her name. It's called the RIA Foundation. Its mission, and this comes directly from the website, is to support the dreams of aspiring artists by promoting art awareness, funding educational opportunities in the arts, and establishing art programs. We'll include a link on our website, caseacquaint.com, to the foundation, or you can just head over to riafoundation.org. That's R-I-A foundation.org. Now let's talk about the police. As you heard, the police looked into Maria's personal life, and they couldn't find anybody connected to her in any way who had a motive or even anyone who didn't like her. They came to the belief years ago that Maria's shooting was either random or possibly accidental because they, over time, eliminated possibility that she personally could be targeted. And that's not to say that it's not possible, but they have not been able to find any information giving them a reason to believe it's a possibility. Also, it's important to mention that the visit to the Q Cafe was not planned. The small group of young women had dinner at a sushi restaurant and after dinner decided to walk around the corner to the Q where they could go dancing for just a couple of hours. The only physical evidence the police have is a fragment of the bullet that struck Maria as she was telling the other girls goodbye just outside the door of the club. Once Maria was on the ambulance and the police were able to begin investigating, they found 500 people being held inside the club by club security, and they interviewed each one of them. Many witnesses outside the club had left the scene when the shot was fired, but some people came forward with information later just not the information the police needed to identify a shooter. Now, I'm going to play for you a clip from a short video produced by the Palo Alto Police Department. I don't know if I needed permission to use this, but I got permission anyway. I think it was originally produced in 2015, and the voice you're going to hear in this video is going to belong to a guy by the name of Zachary Peron. He is a captain at the police department there in Palo Alto. Captain Perone was a young officer at the time of this incident, and he was working the streets. In the course of his shift that night, he was called to the scene of Maria's shooting. This is a cold case, but I think you'll be able to tell from the video that this department is not giving up. It's a very quick little clip. I just think you all deserve to hear it so you can get more of a feel for this case. This case has left a open sore for the Palo Alto community, and it's something that we desperately want to solve, not only for the Palo Alto community, for the Palo Alto Police Department, but most of all, for the family of Maria Schau. And they deserve closure. They deserve to know what happened that night to their daughter. Uh, it was a shocking, shocking crime, and it's remained unsolved, and that's not acceptable. Palo Alto is a safe place. This stuff shouldn't happen here, and when it does, we owe it to the community, and the community owes it to the family to figure out what actually happened that night. I went to Maria's service after she had passed away. Several of us did from the police department, and her family passed out little pink ribbons that we put on our lapels and wore on our uniforms throughout the service. And I still have that ribbon, and I look at that ribbon every time I put my uniform on. For me personally, I feel like I have a very close bond to Maria. I was there when she passed away, and I wasn't able to do anything to save her. And that has left a big hole in my heart, to be quite honest. And you can go on thousands of calls in your career but there are a certain number of calls that you're always going to remember every detail to them. And this certainly was one of those calls for us. No one has forgotten this case, and no one's forgotten Maria. And that's why we want to do everything we can to try and find out the truth about what happened that night.
You can view or listen to this video in its entirety if you go to the Palo Alto Police Department Facebook page or if you go to their YouTube channel. If you're interested in this case, I would recommend that you go and check it out. It has a lot of good information in it. So the police department seems to be doing everything it can. I wish you could say that there are a bunch of rumors online and people are posting all over their social media that they know who it was. If I found something like that, I'd be the first to report it so I could get my $100,000 maybe to help close the case. This is a case in which probably only a handful of people know what happened. The gun was shot by someone, and there's no possible way other people didn't see it or didn't know who did it. It begs one of our questions here. Could this have been an accident that someone is so ashamed of that they just can't come forward? Is it eating them up inside? It would eat me up inside if I'd accidentally pulled out my gun and somehow pulled the trigger, killing an innocent person. Even if a friend of mine at the time, you know, 16, 17 years ago, had made that kind of a mistake. For a regular person, the stress that keeping this secret would produce is just not worth it to our health. Especially if a person was a juvenile when it happened. You know, we're seeing more and more that juveniles are responsible for much of the violent crime in our country, for obvious reasons. People make mistakes and they have accidents. But we can't forget that a person lost their life. Someone lost their child, their sister, their friend. Maria deserved better than that. Even if it was an accident, come forward, tell the police what happened. This was in California, which on average has extremely understanding juries, and the family needs to know what happened. A lot of times that's really what it comes down to. They just want to know. So let's not prolong this agony for them. We're living in a time right now that's so amazing. The ability to disseminate information and communicate with one another, which actually Palo Alto has played a huge role in over the years. But this ability can be such a gift to these cold cases. So share that police department's video. If you have a suspicion, if you heard something from a friend or family member or acquaintance, just call the tip line. It's anonymous, but you can also collect $100,000. Don't forget. Also, we'd like to hear your thoughts on this case. Was it an accident? Was it on purpose? Was Maria targeted? What do you think? Let us know. Visit us on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, YouTube, our website, wherever you can find us. Just give us your best idea. And if anything develops in this case, we're going to post an update for you. Maria Ann Shao would have been almost 38 years old this Valentine's Day. What would her life have looked like if she had not been killed on that June evening? If you have any information, they've made it particularly easy for you to come forward in whatever way is most comfortable. You can email paloalto at tipnow.org, text or leave an anonymous message at 650-383-8984, or you can call the Detective Bureau to speak with someone at 650-329-2597. As always, we'll post this on our website, caseacquaint.com, so you can save a piece of paper if you want. I'd like to thank the Palo Alto Police Department for allowing us to use part of that video. I'd like to thank Captain Perone for speaking with me on the phone, and I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode today and for caring about Maria. We'll talk again soon.